What is deconstruction? Derrida himself said it was an ugly word, but one that he was stuck with, and it was associated most with his name. At its most basic sense, deconstruction simply says that something that is constructed can be deconstructed, can be taken apart. Now, that might be an object in the world, a chair, a table, a car, any of those things, or it might be a concept such as God or such as truth. For Derrida, this did not mean you were destroying the thing. Deconstruction is not destruction. The thing still is there after you've done the process. However, it is to look at the things that have constructed that thing. To take a word like God, Derrida here follows Wittgenstein, who said that to see how a word, what a word means, look at how it's used. So we can look at the history of religion. We can look at the history of atheism. We can look at all of these things to deconstruct something like God. Now, Derrida remains agnostic on whether these concepts actually exist. So truth, for instance, whether truth exists or not, is not the question that deconstruction attempts to answer. Rather, it attempts to see how it's been constructed, why it was constructed, who constructed it, and for what reasons. So when you do an act of deconstruction, you are looking at the ways the word has been built up, the way the concept has been built up. The other thing Derrida noted was that deconstruction does not happen from the outside. Deconstruction happens within a context, within a text. So any text, for instance, cannot be completely coherent and whole in itself. It will keep bearing the scars of its construction. And these are the scars that you look for when you're taking apart a text, the places where there's a contradiction, where there's a gap, where a word has been used in a different way by the same author over the course of a paragraph, a word, a text. Now, we're quite used to doing this in normal life. If there was now a glitch in this video, you would assume that I'd said something wrong, that I'd started again, any of those things. You would look for the way that this video has been constructed. The job of the person taking this video is to smooth over those things, to make them disappear, to end up with a coherent text. However, we know that what has happened is something has been constructed and can therefore be deconstructed. As with any biography, one of the questions you have to ask is how does the childhood of the thinker affect their work? And there's all the normal caveats to do with that. One doesn't just want to take every event in a thinker's life and then transfer that into their thought. There's a lot more going on. However, Derrida, in a sense, gives us permission to do so. His later works were very autobiographical and often quite fascinating and moving on these very topics. Derrida was born in Algeria in 1930, which was quite a date because it was 100 years since the French had taken over Algeria. He was born Jewish in a secular Jewish family. He was born as a Pied Noir, therefore a French citizen of Algeria, which meant when he was growing up, all his lessons were in French, the geography was in French, the history was in French, even most of the street names and places were in French. But he was also dark skinned and therefore could pass for an Arab. So he was caught at this kind of nexus between the French Pied Noirs, the Arab population, the Jewish population, the secular population, and these identities shifted a lot over time. And his interest in identity as a disordered thing, as a constructed thing, he himself related back to this upbringing where he had no stable sense of self. In particular, he related it back to an event that occurred when he was 13 years old in 1943, when he, as a Jewish boy, was excluded from his school and sent to a Jewish school. The citizenship of the Jewish population of Algeria was withdrawn, and this had a deep effect on him. It was an arbitrary withdrawal, and he was suddenly labelled as Jewish. This was problematic for him, not because it was Jewish, obviously, but the sense of being labelled by an arbitrary system outside of himself, something that all of us have encountered at certain points, but for him was absolutely crucial. A year later, he was allowed to go back to school as citizenship resumed, but forever this remained part of his makeup. The fact that identity, somewhat constructed from inside, can also be imposed and is complicated for very many reasons. And later on, he wrote very movingly about borders and immigration and sense of self. And they all came, I think, and he thought, from these childhood interruptions in who Jacques Derrida was. In popular culture today, Derrida often comes up in two different ways. One is a kind of code word for complexity. He wrote in a deliberately complex style because his thoughts needed it. So someone can say, it's all gone a bit Derrida, or you're being very Derrida about this. The other way is when he's accused of being the father of post-truth, of cultural Marxism in some sense, whatever that means. That being a phrase often thrown at people without people ever really believing it. So is he the father of post-truth? Derrida was always at pains to point out that he was not a relativist thinker. 
To say that truth could be deconstructed is not to say truth does not exist. In fact, he was trying to get very close to how we live our normal lives. We all do this. We all have different registers of truth that we deal with. For instance, if I'm doing quadratic equations, I have one criteria of truth. If I then read a poem, I have a different one. It would be absurd for me to take the criteria of truth I use for quadratic equations and apply it to poetry or to talking to a friend or to philosophy, all of these things. Derrida was specifically talking about truth in philosophy, at least initially, but it was a constructed thing. Whether it existed or not, he did not know in the same way that we don't know whether God exists and yet religion exists. Truth, therefore, generates philosophy, but we cannot tie it down. We cannot nail it. Now, all of us slip between these registers of truth very simply to the point where we don't even notice we're doing it. It would be absurd for me to get nervous about reading a poem because I had just done those quadratic equations. To take the notorious example when post-truth was born, in a sense, the inauguration of Donald Trump, the alternative facts, what was being appealed to there when they were saying there were more at the inauguration than at Obama's was mathematics. Now, mathematics is a system which has a system of truths. If the people arguing there were more people there wanted to say that mathematics is wrong, we need to start all over again, then they were free to do so. However, simply to say that there were more people is untrue. And Derrida would have acknowledged that, the same as Derrida would have acknowledged that if there's water pouring out of the sky, then you'll get wet if you go outside. In no sense does he say truth is relative, rather it's constructed and there's different registers and systems. Well, in many of his actions, particularly in the 80s and 90s, where he supported the cause of overthrowing apartheid in South Africa, he was probably a classic liberal democratic lefty. However, in his thinking, things are more ambiguous. He was one who resisted in all of his thinking the notion of decision. To make a decision, he argued, was to commit an act of violence. And all of us who have done anything in the political realm know this feeling. To join something is to simplify it, to take a position is to ignore all the arguments against that position. Now, sometimes, of course, this is incredibly useful in politics, but it was not a position Derrida took easily and struggled against it. He particularly struggled when he was at ENS, when he was at school, where he was expected to become a Stalinist, where many of the students did so. For Derrida, this was already complex as an Algerian, where the, the French Communist Party had notoriously supported the French against the Algerian uprising, so he was already uncomfortable with that. But it was also to take a decision on a very ambiguous and undecidable issue. Derrida throughout his life tried to split the difference. He has been accused of political quietism for this by many people. However, interestingly, Alain Baudieu, a very political thinker, a very political activist, called Derrida a brave man of peace. That, in any political system, some of the critics' job is not to rush to the barricade, but rather to analyse and analyse and analyse. Derrida did this throughout his life while still acting politically. And in books like Spectres of Marx, one of his greatest books, he looked at the way that Marxism continued after the fall of the Berlin Wall as a spectre that continued to haunt liberal democratic thinking. This was the, always his tactic, to look at something from inside, to avoid that moment of decision and to hold things up in the air and to look at all sides of what was going on. So why does Derrida remain important today? He's not quite the rock star philosopher he was in the 80s and 90s, where any discussion of philosophy or politics had to include his name. However, he remains vital in the academy and in the wider culture. Stella Sanford put it that we are all post-Derridians now, in the same way that we're all post-Freudians. You can't go back to a time before him. So in terms of post-truth, he is someone who allows us to assess the truth claims of various political parties at the moment various people, various cultural thinkers. So that is of vital importance. He looks for the gaps. He looks for the construction in all of these things. He's also hugely important in law. His writings about law and justice in the later part of his career in ethics were also hugely vital. How is law constructed? How is it made? And who does it suit to make those laws? In terms of the canon, his opening up of other texts and to an analyse them for why they are part of the canon has continued on. And we see a deconstruction of the canon in many universities. But also in the topic of intersectionality, which has become important now, in which many of the cultural wars seem to centre around, those defending it, those attacking it. Derrida, in looking at identity, the way it's constructed, 
the way that voices have been absent opens up space for the conversations about intersectionality that are going on today, both in the academy and in the wider world. So Derrida remains an important, vital thinker, and perhaps we've reached a stage where the rock star thing has been pushed to one side, and we can just take him on as a philosopher, which is how he always saw himself. <laughs>